شرف ده شرف لينا ده هو هنا بس لازم نشد هنا لا ممكن ما نشدش لا ممكن ما نشدش Good afternoon, dear colleagues. This is the second session about intervention bronchology. The session just ended a minute before was about the intervention bronchology in malignant disease. This session about intervention bronchology in penile disease. It's uh, my pleasure to co-chair this session with Professor Gamal Rabia, uh, Professor of Pulmonary Disease in Asyut University, Upper Egypt. Uh, because we are short of time, I beg all the speakers that to deliver this, their talk in 13 minutes, leaving two minutes at the end of each talk for discussion. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. الحقيقة لازم أشكر الأول الأستاذ دكتور طارق صفوت والأستاذ دكتور أشرف حاتم والأستاذ دكتور أحمد الحلفاوي إن أعطاني الفرصة إن تو شير ذي سيجن وذ بروفيسور عادل الخطاب أند أور إيمينانت ناشونال أند إنترناشونال سبيكر أند إت إز ماي بليجر تو إنتروديوس ماي تيتشر بروفيسور طارق محفوظ هي إز ذا ليدر أوف شيست ديزيز إن أبر إيجيبت أند إن أول أوفر ذا إيجيبت هي ويل سبيك أباوت السيرابيوتيك برونكوسكوبي A non-stenotic benign lesion. Thank you very much, Professor Gamel. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, in a few years ago, I was looking to the cardiologists working in the intervention field to be very lucky. And uh, the intervention bronchology, they are unlucky because we are working mainly with the cancer patients, not only cancer patients, but also the advanced cancer patients, and the cardiologists were working with the patients with uh, benign lesions. However, nowadays, I think that a few years ago, starting the field of intervention bronchology and therapeutic bronchoscope to be expanding and to deal with the, and, uh, the benign lesions, and so I think that we start to be lucky because those patients are living so much not like the cancer patients. However, I think that we can divide the benign lesions dealing with into stenotic and non-stenotic lesions. And to start with uh, the stenotic lesions, I think that the majority of the cases of the stenotic lesions uh, due to benign pathology that uh, you can start dealing with in a simple cases of stenosis when the stenosis is induced by retained secretions just with a saline gush, and this could be successful, I think, could be successful in a good number of cases to open the stenotic airways. And if this is not successful, we resort to either to the less popular technique of the balloon dilatation or the most popular technique of the stent insertion. And I think that we had a good talk about the stents uh, uh, from uh, the previous speakers, and uh, just to be very comprehensive on the non-stenotic tracheobronchial lesions, I think to start, we can start with the role of flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy in foreign body removal. This is the first indication of the therapeutic bronchoscopy nowadays. And I think that the foreign body removal became a worldwide problematic issue in the recent few years all over the world. In the United States, they account for about 7% of accidental deaths in the age of children below four years old. And I think that more than two thirds of the foreign bodies are below the age of three years in children. And uh, the foreign body lodges in the main airways, mainly uh, in two thirds of the patients rather than in the distal uh, bronchi. So I think that two thirds of the foreign body in the children are situated in the main airways. The big debate is still evolving 
between whether to deal with the foreign bodies by the rigid or the fiber optic bronchoscopy. And I think that the, although the rigid bronchoscopy is the modality of a choice for the pediatric centers, but still the fiber optic bronchoscopy is the preferred tool for at least initial diagnosis of foreign bodies in the adult patients. Still, the fiber optic bronchoscopy has several advances over the rigid bronchoscopy, uh, and because it is more safe procedure and uh, it needs less experience, and it became, it actually, the cause, the fiber optic bronchoscopy, it transformed the technique of endoscopy from the surgeon to the medical uh, respiratory physicians. And fiber optic bronchoscopy, I think that it can deal much better with distally wedged foreign bodies. And fiber optic bronchoscopy is the only, machine, only tool to deal with mechanically ventilated patients. And in cases where rigid bronchoscopic manipulation is impossible, like fracture of the spine jaw or skull fracture. And again, flexible bronchoscopy, sometimes it is difficult and potentially risky. And uh, uh, in large foreign bodies, uh, it is impossible in most cases to remove with the fiber optic bronchoscopy. Again, in critically ill patients, the use of uh, uh, sedation may depress the ventilation. Uh, besides, it's the difficult suction and the narrow field in the fiber optic bronchoscopy relative to the rigid instrument. The rigid bronchoscopy provides a much wider uh, spectrum of intervention and it allows one for adequate ventilation and oxygenation in critical situations. And obstructing granulation tissue can be removed with the, uh, associated with the foreign body neglected and can be cored out besides that the stenosis can be dilated with the shaft of the rigid bronchoscope and uh, you can, I think that Professor Tariq Safat is very expert in this technique uh, of the dilatation with the shaft of the bronchoscope and the removal of the foreign body. Again, the larger forceps of the rigid bronchoscope can better remove the foreign body uh, uh, or the mechanical uh, depth, and, but still it has the disadvantage, of course, that the patients can't uh, uh, go home directly because the rigid instrument needs general anesthesia. Uh, for removal of the foreign body, we have two techniques mainly. Either the forceps, you can use the forceps. Many types of forceps can be uh, passed through the working channel of the bronchoscope or through the cryotherapy. And this is just only uh, a very snapshot about the technique of removal of the removal of the foreign body by the cryotherapy. You can see here that we introduce through the working channel the prop of the cryo, and just to remove this, is the metallic foreign body is getting out from the scope. This is just only as a snapshot. The second benign indication for the rigid bronchoscopy in the benign field, I mean, is dealing with the lung abscess. And although postural drainage and the antibiotic therapy are still the cornerstone for the management of lung abscess, and surgical, uh, surgery is only reserved for special situations, but still bronchoscopic castor drainage can have a role in the management of resistant abscess with enlarging cavity or lack of clinical improvement, we can resort to bronchoscopic castle drainage of the pus in these cases to help of emptying of the abscess. The third indication for the benign, uh, the third benign indication I mean for the bronchoscopy in the recent era is the management of air trapping in advanced emphysematous bolla and COPG and uh, I think that there is a uh, complete lecture in this regard, and though I'm not going to get in depth in this, but we can say that there are three ways for uh, lung volume reduction surgery through the bronchoscopy. 
The first is the airway bypass. The second is the, to insert endobronchial valves. And the third one, still under trial, is to biological remodeling of the airway. The idea, in fact, generally speaking, of the, uh, of the lung volume reduction surgery is to restore the chest wall and the diaphragmatic mechanics that induce some improvement of the dyspnea of these miserable patients. And for regarding the first method, which is the airway bypass, it depends this technique on the collateral ventilation. And the collateral ventilation, by, by definition, uh, it is the movement of the gas from one part of the lung to another through non-anatomical pathways. And actually, we have three collateral ventilation pathways, the intraalveolar pores, the bronchoalveolar connections, and the interbronchial uh, channels. And uh, the airways bypass procedure are initially performed by bronchoscopically puncturing the wall of the segmental bronchi with radiofrequency catheter and inserting special design stent to keep open the internal bronchopulmonary communications. So during inspiration, the regular airways can open, allowing the air passage through the normal cha uh, channels. And on expiration, the new bypass passages provide escape pathways by passing the obstructed small airways. The idea of the valve system is to block the airway supplying the most overinflated emphysematous parts of the lung that can cause atelectasis of these regions and contribute to control of the symptoms, at least partially, in fact. And this is the photo for the for this, uh, 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 valves. This is the old valve, the spiration valve, and this is the recently used one, which is the fear new generation endobronchial valve. And this is x-ray picture for inserted three valves in the orifice of the upper loop to collapse the uh, hyperinflated part and uh, for, of the right upper loop. The third method of the endobronchial lung volume reduction is the uh, biological remodeling. And this method actually can be induced by an installation through the working channel of the bronchoscope of 10 milliliter of solution containing 5,000 units of trypsin to deactivate the surfactant and promote the detachment of the epithelial cells. And thus, it is like the valve-based system in that it is directly reduced the lung volume by collapsing and sealing damaged areas of the hyperinflated lungs in patients with heterogeneous upper loop emphysema, but it differs from the valve system in that the biological remodeling acts through acts at the alveolar level and the changes induced are permanent, while the endobronchial valve system, it acts actually on the airway level and uh, the changes are temporary that you can remove the valve at any time you want. The other benign, uh, indication of the benign intervention bronchology is the recent technique of the bronchial thermoplasty for management of resistant asthma. And in fact, this technique is still under trial and its safety profile and its uh, uh, advantage and its effect is still not confirmed so much. But we can say that the technique of the bronchial thermoplasty is only indicated in resistant cases not responding to treatment. And the concept of treating the airways by this technique is to induce heat generated by radiofrequency energy uh, to block the bronchial smooth muscle tone among the asthmatics. And this picture shows the castor induced to, uh, through the working channel of the bronchoscope. And here, the castor conducts radiofrequency energy to the airways by direct contact to the airway wall. And here, the bronchoscope is directed, as you see, to the target area. And the basket is open. 
the radiofrequency heat treatment is activated and then it moves to another area and so on. And usually we need three uh, successive days for this technique to be repeated to induce effect. And the majority of the patients who tried this technique, they were willing to repeat it again, which means that the side effects of the technique is still very minimal and the efficacy may be uh, of benefit. Uh, the other technique is the management of hemopsis, and this is a very important era. And the management of hemopsis, definitely it needs the rigid bronchoscope, and there are several techniques used to deal with hemopsis bronchoscopically. Usually we start with wedging of the bleeding segment with the flexible or rigid bronchoscope tip, and this could be effective. And if not sufficient, this technique, we ad, uh, inject or installate locally adrenaline one over 20,000 uh, concentration solution with cold saline, with cold saline lavage with uh, about 500 milliliter of ice saline at four degrees centigrade. And in many cases, this maneuver is, could be sufficient to control hemopsis. And uh, usually, to be fair enough, dealing with massive hemopsis, we should use the rigid instrument rather than the fiber optic bronchoscopy because the rigid instrument, it allows adequate pulmonary ventilation, fast and efficient blood clot aspiration. Again, it's good endoscopic vision and more selective lung intubation. And so the rigid bronchoscope is mandatory in these cases. And here this is again a snapshot within one or two minutes, one minute, for the control of bleeding through gush of saline with adrenaline. This is the bleeding area, and you can see here, when you gush the saline with adrenaline, it could be efficient to stop bleeding to a great extent. This is the saline rush here with adrenaline, ice saline. And we do wash, and we repeat it. We repeat about 500 ml of cold ice saline. And this could be successful in stoppage of the bleeding. Another way to deal with the hemopsis is the endobronchial sealing bronchoscopically. And here, this technique depends mainly on the fact that the uh, uh, cyanoacrylate is a biocompatible adhesive that solidifies quickly on exposure to uh, uh, humidity with antibacterial activity. And so cyanoacrylate glue have prothrombotic properties that increase platelet aggregation and enhance the local thromboxane production. And through this mechanism, it can play an effective role in the management of homopsis. And this diagram demonstrates the working castor induced through the working channel of the bronchoscope, and the, the sclerosing material is injected after contact to the bleeding area. Another way for controlling of the hemopsis bronchoscopically is the use of Fogarty balloon castor, and this successfully including the main lobar bronchi in cases of severe hemopsis, and this picture to show the balloon situated at the proximal site of the bleeding after the procedure. Under trial now, there is a topical hemostatic tamponade through in, uh, putting oxidized regenerating cellulose mesh that uh, through the flexible or rigid bronchoscope to achieve the control of hemopsis. Another way is to control the hemopsis more invasive depends either on the freezing hemostasis or the heat hemostasis. And actually in Egypt, we practice a good cases of combination between the freezing during the same session. It starts usually with cryotherapy followed by the argon plasma coagulation in cases of semi And I think this could be successful in the majority of cases to induce effective hemostasis. And this again, a snapshot for one case with severe hemopsis using the argon plasma coagulation in our center to control the hemopsis.
just you can see, this is non-contact mode, of course, and the hemostasis can be induced and stoppage of bleeding. That's enough for the sake of time. And then another snapshot for the cryotherapy, just to stop bleeding here. You can see also this is a case of bronchial adenoma and uh, causing gross hemopsis. And this is the cryotherapy. You can see the ice ball that can be induced on the surface of the adenoma. And through freezing of this, this is the ice ball induced here by the prop on the surface of the tumor. And it could be effectively controllable of hemopsis. And the last indication of the benign bronchoscopic interference is the treatment of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. And in fact, the whole lung lavage is the treatment of a choice for the majority of cases of alveolar proteinosis, but still it has the disadvantage of inducing either hypoxemia or the hemodynamic instability. But in fact, nowadays they use the multiple lower lavage could be an alternative and more safe way for the whole lung lavage in patients with mild to moderate pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, and we choose the mostly affected lobe according to the high resolution CT chest. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mahfouz. Any question? So. We can shift to the next speaker, Professor Atul Mehta. He's a professor of medicine, vice chair, pulmonary and critical care medicine, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, Ohio, USA. And he moved to our area. He's now the chief medical officer, Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. What's not written uh, in the program, he is uh, our eminent guest for the bronchology meeting for the next seven or eight years, and he is a professor and friend of all of us. Professor Mehta will give us a talk about how to increase TPNA yield. So, while the technology is, is about working now? Yes. How many of you do flexible bronchoscopy? One here. <laughs> All right. So I would like you guys to just do TDMA to be almost as good as ultrasound That's That is what the next 15 minutes. It's a big task, but I'll try to do that. Uh, so, you know, transponder aspiration. I'm sorry. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. TDMA, you know, there is a learning curve, but I think that it is a much simpler technique as compared to ultrasound, because in ultrasound you have to learn four different things. You have to learn how to use the bronchoscope because it is different. It has got 30 degree angle. You need to, you need to learn how to interpret the uh, endoscopic images, you need to ultrasound images. So that is another tool you need to learn. Third is a very complicated needle. Right, Tarek? The needle is very complicated. And last but not the least, you have to know how, how all the knobs on the machine. It is now, it's a science. It is called as knobology. When you use or know how to know, use all these knobs. I still feel that one must know how to do TBNA before he or she jumps into doing transbronchial uh, endobronchial ultrasound. So once this computer opens up, I'll, I'll show you uh, how you can improve, the, improve your yield with TBNA. Now, the question also is that if I know how to do endobronchial ultrasound, do I need to learn transbronchial needle aspiration. And that is a question I want to answer in a, in a couple minutes as well. So let's see, uh, it's, it's, it's a technology. Uh, okay, conventional TBN. 
I'll take you through very quickly. I have a few videos. I, I, I hope I can show you them. Okay, so let's just go to the main thing here. What happened? Okay. Is there a place for conventional TBNA when you see all this ultrasound equipment, every hospital popping up? Very simple is, even today, there are lots of institutions they cannot afford to buy EBUS ultrasound. Let's just face it. We don't have it in our budget. So you need to still learn TBNA. You have the machine, and I know lots of, inst lots of institutions Ultrasound equipment is hanging around there because they don't know exactly how to use it and it is just sitting there. They bought it but they did not use it. There is not enough volume to maintain skills and nowadays, you know, training and experience and, and credentialing and privileging and all those things require maintaining certain number of procedures a year to maintain your skills. And if you're not doing 50 some ultrasound TBNAs a year, you're not going to be a very good ultrasonographer in the endobronchial tree. EBUS scopes are for repair. If you break an EBUS scope, it is going to take about a month, three weeks to month to get it repaired. It is not that those scopes are hanging in the cabinet, they're going to give you another one. A regular bronchoscope, they give you a loaner if you break it, but for ultrasound, it is not a loaner that you have to wait till it gets repaired. So we bought two. So that if one breaks down, we can use another one. So my partner broke both of them. So then, are you going to stop your TBNA practice and say, no, no, no. We just do with ultrasound. We cannot do TBNA. Now I'm doing a bronchoscopy and find an indication to do TBNA. Am I going to pull that bronchoscope out and put an ultrasound in? Favorable locations, subcarinal locations, right paratracheal lymph nodes, two centimeter lymph nodes, you don't need to do endobronchial ultrasound. And peripheral locations, of course, you don't need a peripheral, uh, you need an endobronchial ultrasound for that. What I'm trying to say is that even if you have endobronchial ultrasound equipment in your institution, you need to learn transbronchial needle aspiration. That is the point I'm trying to make. So there is a place for transbronchial needle aspiration. So how do I increase my yield? If the slide moves, I can show it to you, but its slide is not moving. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it is, it is all, it is frozen. Okay, please don't count this minutes to my lecture. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Any lectures on bronchoscopy? Do you have any questions while this is getting fixed up? Everybody knows everything about bronchoscopy, so there is no questions at all. Okay. <laughs> right? All right. Okay, so if you want to increase your yield for transbronchial needle aspiration, what I want you to do is remember these eight T's. Time, targeting, type of the needle, technique, trained assistant, tissue preparation, tissue interpretation, and training. Time is that you need to spend some time looking at the CAT scan. EBUS TBNA, EBUS tells you where you should go. My targeting, time I use to look at my target and concentrate and make, make mental image, regular TBNA, conventional TBNA, I know where to go. EBUS, tell, EBUS TBNA tells you where to go. That is the difference between conventional and EBUS TBNA. You just remember time. I spent five minutes, ten minutes looking at the CAT scan, create a mental image, look, find my location. That's where I'm going to go. That is, that is the time I spend. Targeting, I use all the tools available to know beforehand where my lymph nodes are. All, let me, let me take you through this. Yes. Okay. Uh, this, yes. So what I do for every elective TBNA or bronchoscopy, you have to have a CAT scan. Then I flip my CAT scan so that I know that CAT scan is matching exactly the patient's anatomy the way the patient is laying on the table. Right side on the right, left side on the left. If you have CT fluoroscopy, you can use this and other methods. Now let me show you, again I may not complete my lecture, but I may give you some pointers and just to make the point. Tarek, this picture was drawn in 1993. 
before endobronchial ultrasound was available. This picture was drawn on imagination of a bronchoscopist where his lymph nodes are going to be. So what I'm saying is you have a mental image. He or she said that that's green area, that's where right paratracheal lymph node is. So I knew where my lymph node is. Ultrasound tells you where you should go. What I'm saying that before you start bronchoscopy, have the mental image. And once you have the mental image, you can improve your diagnostic yield. I flip the CAT scan, right side is on the right side, left side is on the left side. It exactly tells me where to look for my lymph node. As you see, right paratracheal lymph node. Before I enter the endobronchial tree, I know that my lymph node is at 2 o'clock, 2 centimeters above the carina. So I know where exactly I'm going to put. That is what I call is targeting. Also, CT scan helps you look at the type of nodules, and I'm not going to go in the details of that. If the bronchus sign is positive, you don't need to do transbronchial needle aspiration, and that is what this CT scan helps you. If you have other tools, of course, if you have virtual bronchoscopy, if you have CT fluoroscopy, you can increase the diagnostic or transbronchial needle aspiration. All TBNA needles are not the same. You select the needle which is most appropriate for your indication. You want to make a diagnosis of sarcoidosis and use cytology needle, needle very unlikely you would make the diagnosis. <coughs> so select the needle based on the indication. I don't have time to go in the details, but I make the point. Next T is that of the technique. <coughs> the most common complication of transbronchial needle aspiration, and that also for ultrasound, is damage to the channel of the bronchoscope. And if you damage the channel, you cause significant damage to bronchoscope, very expensive damages. And this is the way you use, the, this is the correct way of using it on the left upper corner. All others are wrong way of using the transbronchial needle aspiration. I call this thing $8,000 band. This is not the way you insert the catheter into the, bronch into the bronchoscope and the bronchoscope is bent like that. You always insert the catheter when the bronchoscope is a neutral forward viewing position, you insert the catheter like that and then you protect the bronchoscope. This is the band, this is the most vulnerable part of the bronchoscope, right here. You keep it as straight as possible so that the, your instruments don't impact on the working channel of the bronchoscope, okay? You take a step stool, if you're a short bronchoscopist like myself, take a step stool so that you increase the distance between your arm and the patient's face so that the bronchoscope does not bend in that fashion. And if you do this, you'll prevent damages to the bronchoscope and reduce the cost and improve the yield. You must know what the leak test is when you do the flexible bronchoscopy. I don't have time to go through this. Two points, very important points for transbronchial needle aspiration, and Samra would agree with me, is that these two slides, the needle should enter the tracheobronchial wall at least at 45 degree angle as it is shown on the left side. If it is more than that, if it is parallel to the tracheobronchial wall, you are not getting into the lymph node and the entire length of the needle should go out into the lymph node. If half of the needle is hanging inside the endobronchial tree, you are not going to get the diagnostic yield, okay? So that is how you improve the yield. Jabbing method, <clears throat> you push the catheter, it does not work all the time. If it works, my partner, my friend, Dr. Gasparini is using jabbing method. He's pushing the catheter just to put the needle through the tracheobronchial wall. In my hand, it works maybe about 50% of the time, maybe less. As you can see, he's jabbing the catheter to put the needle through the tracheobronchial wall. But if you do not use this method properly, what may happen is the catheter may get kinked outside the bronchoscope. This is the jabbing method. And if you don't use it properly, you kink the catheter and you may not get any further use of the needle and the yield is poor. I use piggyback method. I use my little finger to stabilize the bronchoscope at the proximal end of the catheter and then I push the bronchoscope itself. So catheter and the bronchoscope is pushed together which is referred as piggyback method, and in my hand, it works 100% of the time, and hopefully I can show you. Look at the little finger, stabilizing the catheter and pushing the bronchoscope rather than jabbing the, rather than jabbing the catheter. That works in my hand 100% of the time. 
If you cannot do it with your small hands, you can have your assistant help you with the piggy bag method and it works all the time. Just to show you how it works very quickly. Okay, and there you go. It should work. You will not see the catheter coming out. You will see the bronchoscope pushing the needle all through. That is the piggy bag method which works in my hand all the time. That improves the diagnostic heal. Just one, one thing I want to show you, histology needle. If you use the histology needle, it is slightly different than cytology needle. Histology needle needs to come in and out, in and out, in and out to grab the piece of tissue into the barrel of the lymph, barrel of the catheter. It is just not by agitation where you are trying to get broken cells or few scattered cells in the specimen. Just to show you how the histology needle is used as compared to cytology needle, in and out motion is required to get in and out motion is required to get a his good histology specimen <coughs> and that is what I'm trying to show you here. You'll see that in and out, in and out, in and out for histology specimen, okay? Let me skip this thing. How many, how many uh, aspirates at each site? Four will work. Very important point. You are only as good as your technical assistant. I am only the best because I work with the best. If you don't have a good bronchoscopy nurse or an assistant, you cannot increase your diagnostic yield. I cannot emphasize that thing on this more. Let me tell you just two lines, how to prepare the specimen. Cytology specimen are prepared dry, followed by wet method. Air spray on the slide, smear it, and put it in the solution. You do not dilute it with a hang solution or formalin or saline or anything of the sort. Dry spray, air spray on the slide, mm -hmm. smear it, and then flush the catheter into the cytolite solution. If it is histology, you flush the whole specimen into the container. Rapid on-site examination, we have already talked about, and I would not spend time on that. For histology, you are looking for that big piece of tissue, so you flush the specimen, you don't smear it, and send the whole thing to cytology lab. If there is adequate tissue, they will give you histology specimen. If the cytology lab sees there is not enough for histology, they will spin it down and give you cytology results so you don't lose any part of the specimen. So histology specimen goes to cytology lab to make diagnosis of either tuberculosis, caseating granulomas on cytology on a histology specimen versus histology of diagnosis of sarcoidosis made in this fashion. Training, more you do it, more training you get, that's all you are doing here. Training and experience improves the diagnostic hill. So what I did in last 15 minutes, I told you why you should learn TBNA even if you have EBUS. And how to increase the yield? Time. Spend some time looking at the CAT scan. Do the targeting, have a mental image where you want to go before you enter the Bronx suite. Know the type of the needle you need to require. Learn the technique. Piggyback method is better than jabbing method. Have a trained assistant. You know how to prepare the specimen. You learn how to interpret the specimen. And last but not the least, training and experience improves the diagnostic hill. Don't be afraid of the complications of TBNA. I'm not afraid of bleeding. I'm not afraid of pneumothorax. What I'm afraid of a non-diagnostic bronchoscopy. If you decide to do the bronch, you must come out with the diagnosis. If you don't use TBNA, you will miss diagnosis in 20% of the patients. What I'm showing you here, look at this nice joke or ni nice cartoon. These are the two paleontologists looking for dinosaur bones. And one guy is telling another guy, oh, well, another day is digging shot to hell. They could not find any dinosaur bones. Right. We are all looking for lung cancer. If you don't have TBNA, you are going to miss the diagnosis in 20% of the patients. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mehta. Any questions? Yes, sir. I'm glad somebody is asking questions. Okay. Maybe it is too cold in this That's a very practical question. The question is that after you obtain the specimen, how you preserve the specimen, that is the question. If you are going to do rapid on-site psychological examination, there is no problem. It is not available 
the container where you put the slides in, okay, preservative is, light, is, is alcohol. It is 98% alcohol. So you smear it, dry it, put it in alcohol, it goes to cytology lab. This question is not good for me, but you should talk to your pathologist. How do you want to prepare the specimen? How do you want me to send specimen to you? That is what you want to ask your, ask your pathologist, okay? Sir. Yes. Yes. Okay, let me repeat this thing. The question is, what is the incidence of bleeding and what is the difference between cytology needle versus histology needle? That is the question. And answer to this is, there is no data on that. There are some anecdotes reported that histology needle can cause more bleeding than cytology needle. And I agree with those anecdotes which are reported. Basic, and I tell you on occasion, I have seen a spurt of blood coming through the hole which has been created by the histology needle. But with time, with a few seconds to a couple minutes, it stops when you put ice cold saline or epinephrine, it stops. One thing I want to leave with you is if you put a needle in, in the aorta, it is safer than you put a needle in the pulmonary artery because the muscular wall of the aorta will close off that opening. Common sense is a simple thing. I mentioned to you, look at the CT scan and don't put the needle where there is throbbing lesion. Okay, that throbbing lesion is usually a blood vessel. So you, have, you know your anatomy, you looked at your CAT scan, and if you avoid some you know, dangerous areas, you should be able to do fine. Okay, so there should not be any problem. Okay, good. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mehta. And I call uh, Professor uh, Terhan from Turkey to speak about the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, dear uh, chairperson and uh, dear colleague, uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee first uh, to invite me this meeting. I will talk about the bronchoscopic uh, lung volume reduction uh, for emphysema patient and severe COPD patients. Uh, this is, um, by the way, I'm working for in Istanbul University Medical School. This is the uh, medical center of Istanbul University. I'm working in this old building. And you, maybe you can see the uh, tower in the main uh, uh, building of the Istanbul University. And I don't have any conflict of interest about this talk. And, um, as we know, there are some uh, management options uh, uh, for uh, severe COPD patients. Uh, generally, we do non-pharmacologic management, uh, like smoking cessation and uh, reduction of disability and handicap. And also, we order some non-invasive mechanical ventilation machine to the uh, very severe COPD patient, uh, like a home ventilation. And also, we order a lot of uh, bronchodilator uh, drugs and anti-inflammatory drugs for the COPD patients. But uh, as we know, uh, most of COPD patients doesn't come to uh, early stage in their uh, diseases. Uh, generally, they come to doctors uh, at uh, stage three and stage four. Uh, that's why last 10 years we talk about uh, surgical therapy for them. And uh, last 10 years especially, we discuss about bronchoscopic uh, treatment uh, for severe COPD patients. Uh, as we know, uh, there is uh, some uh, hyperinflation in the severe COPD patients. There is no space in the uh, thoracic cavity, and uh, diaphragm uh, goes down, and uh, it cannot move to up and downside, and uh, that's why uh, severe COPD patients uh, uh, suffering from the shortness of breath. Uh, if we uh, reduce the uh, volume of the lung, uh, hyperinflated lung. 
uh, our patients can feel better than uh, uh, before because uh, diaphragm can move up and down and uh, lungs move uh, and uh, inspiration can be easy than before. And what kind of surgical management options is there in the uh, COPD patient, uh, severe COPD patients? For uh, huge bilose emphysema patients, of course, there is a bilectomy options. And uh, second one, uh, lung volume reduction surgery. And uh, last one, maybe lung transplantation. But as we know, it's uh, not easy procedure. And most of our patients cannot reach this uh, kind of options. Uh, when we mention about uh, surgical therapy, we have to be careful because most of severe emphysema patients uh, uh, are poor candidates for any surgical intervention because of their uh, pulmonary function and performance status. And that's why metrosurgical patient selection is mandatory. And uh, we can send uh, very severe uh, COPD patients for uh, lung volume reduction surgery, heterogeneous distribution of destruction. But uh, uh, their uh, pulmonary function must, uh, not, uh, must be uh, uh, very bad. Otherwise, homogeneous uh, distribution of destruction or uh, very bad uh, pulmonary function test or uh, also uh, pulmonary artery hypertension patients, we have to send to them to uh, lung transplantation. After this information, uh, national emphysema treatment uh, trial uh, were, was uh, created. As you know, this is the uh, unblinded, multi-center randomized uh, clinical trial. And uh, medical treatment, with, uh, it compares uh, medical treatment with lung volume reduction surgery uh, to medical treatment alone in patients with uh, severe emphysema. Primary endpoints uh, was survival and maximum exercise capacity. Uh, when we uh, look at the results of the net study at uh, uh, six months, after six months, uh, we see that um, FEV1 and uh, six minutes walking test results were better in uh, the surgical group and also survival was better uh, in uh, surgical group than uh, the medical uh, therapy group. Results of this study in patients with upper lobe emphysema, lung volume reduction surgery, improves survival, exercise capacity, and quality of life. And uh, they say that lung volume reduction surgery should be strongly considered for all end-stage emphysema patients with upper lobe predominant disease. Uh, it works, but not in everybody, because this is not simple uh, procedure. Uh, when we uh, look at the results of this uh, study and lung volume reduction surgery, almost 50% of uh, patients uh, had uh, prolonged air leaks and the uh, mortality rate was high. Uh, and also it was not maybe cost effective. Cost effectiveness uh, is questionable. Also it's uh, irreversible. Uh, is it possible to do volume reduction uh, without lung volume reduction surgery? Yes, non-resectional, uh, non-surgical lung volume reduction is possible uh, with the bronchoscope uh, creation of extra anatomical tracts and uh, induction of atelectasis. Uh, how? And the bronchial installation of sealant, insufflation of vapor, and also uh, endobronchial occluders and valves. First, I would like to talk uh, about a little bit uh, bronchus airway bypass. And um, uh, in this uh, study, uh, creates bypass channel to allow air escape hyperinflated lobe. Uh, first, uh, we have to check the uh, uh, neighbor uh, vessels with a Doppler ultrasound probe and then when we uh, decide to puncture area and uh, we do a puncture uh, with needle and then uh, we uh, 
airway wall is punctured with needle, then hole is expanded with a balloon, a drug eluting stent is used to maintain the open uh, channel. There is a study in this, uh, uh, with this method, excellent airway stent for emphysema uh, group, and double branch randomized trial study, and uh, homogeneous, homogeneous emphysema patients. Uh, end of uh, this study, they have found out 12% uh, improvement in the force vital capacity. And uh, other methods, uh, uh, induction of atelectasis, producing controlled atelectasis in target areas of most of affected uh, portion of the lung. Uh, method, installation of sealant, airway coils, uh, wire, uh, volume reduction, and the bronchial octoders and valves. Installation of sealant, first study in the uh, animal, installation of fibrin glue in segmental bronchi in the papain induced sheep, emphysema model. They have created a, a permanent atelectasis for them. And human study uh, with the uh, uh, iris therapeutic bio absorber gel. A gel uh, was injected to a uh, with a, a balloon tip catheter via working channel of bronchoscopy to target uh, area. It works uh, at alveolar level uh, and uh, uh, be independent of collateral ventilation. This information is very important because uh, bronchoscopic venom reduction uh, is uh, not successful for uh, with uh, collateral ventilation patients. You see the human uh, study, and uh, on the left side, two sides, and on the right side, three sides uh, uh, procedure. And after that, the uh, right upper lobe completely and uh, permanently become atelectasis. And another method is uh, bronchoscopic uh, thermal uh, vapor ablation. Steam vapor is delivered to the target areas from this uh, source. and. Uh, it currently performed uh, unilaterally only. Uh, of course, it's uh, not reversible method. Uh, as you see in this slide, uh, there is a, a 61 years old female, and uh, she had an uh, incomplete fissure uh, verified by WADA, WIDA analysis, and uh, her uh, left upper lobe. Uh, procedure. After three months, uh, she had the right, left upper lobe uh, atelectasis permanently. And another method is a numerics airway coil uh, intended for the homogeneous or heterogeneous emphysema. Implanted uh, coils achieve a lung reduction by uh, adhering uh, to airway wall and the pull lobe inwards. Uh, there is a study from uh, uh, Professor Felix Hatt, and uh, after the procedure uh, in the six-minute walking test and residual volume results uh, were uh, very good in the heterogeneous emphysema patients. Last uh, part of my talk is about the blocking device for uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Uh, on the left side, you see the uh, first type of blockers, uh, what are now spigots. Uh, and the others, and also you see uh, the right side uh, two types uh, endobronchial valves. A principal endobronchial occluder and valves is uh, to cause segmental lung collapse by inserting occluders blocking air reentry and undirectional valves blocking air entry and allowing air and mucus exfiltration. You see the aspiration valve. Uh, it uh, redirects airflow to healthier part of the lung, better uh, ventilation perfusion matching. And uh, there is a study, uh, a multi-center pilot study of uh, a bronchial valve for the treatment of severe emphysema. Uh, the Professor uh, Sterman and Professor Atul Mehta and uh, their uh, colleagues and safety and effectiveness of the endobronchial valve. They, are, they were looking for that one. 
and Mount Center study, 91 per, uh, patients uh, has enrolled to this study. And uh, end of this study, they have found out that uh, quality of life and targeted uh, low volume reduction is okay, significantly uh, okay. And endobronchial uh, treatment of emphysema safety and significant improves quality of life. Last one is uh, pulmonex uh, zephyr endobronchial valve. The, as I said to you before, the last 10 years we talk about uh, the uh, bronchoscopic volume reduction methods. Uh, first uh, publishment uh, was in uh, uh, 2003, and uh, Dr. Sinan, Dr. Toma, and then Dr. Yim, Dr. Venuta, and then uh, uh, Dr. Wan and Dr. De Oliveira has published uh, their study. And uh, all of them, uh, conclusion was this procedure is safe, but uh, patient selection is very important. Uh, last one, a uh, one study and the bronchial valve for emphysema palliation trial, mouth center study. This is the uh, uh, United States part of study, uh, 34 uh, centers has enrolled, and uh, 321 patients uh, randomized. And primary efficacy endpoints uh, was changing uh, in FEV1 and six minute walking test in uh, the, the treatment arm and compared to the control uh, at six months. Uh, and second end efficacy endpoint was uh, about uh, quality of life and oxygen consumption. Uh, after the one hour, there's a, uh, for instance here, and uh, if when we uh, look at the results of this study, and at the six months, uh, FEV1 and six minute walking test results uh, uh, were significantly high in the, in the study group and the bronchial wall group. Uh, there is a, a subgroup analysis in this study. Uh, uh, if uh, we choose our patient correctly, uh, procedure will be uh, more successful than the other. Uh, uh, if you uh, look at the uh, right side of the slide, uh, you can see the uh, high successful group, I mean uh, high heterogeneity, uh, lower uh, complete lower occlusion, and uh, uh, low collateral ventilation group. Uh, uh, as you see in this uh, busy slide, uh, the one study research group uh, has been published their study in the New England Journal of Medicine in the uh, uh, last couple months, uh, and U.S. part of this study. Uh, as you see here, there is a very good uh, results uh, uh, in uh, FEV1 and six-minute walking test uh, results. And uh, if we look at the subgroup uh, analysis, uh, as I said before, again, uh, the, there is a high, heter high heterogeneity and complete fissure group patient uh, results uh, better than the other uh, patients. Uh, if I would like to uh, summarize this uh, study, perfect patients, uh, how can we uh, explain to perfect patients? High heterogeneity, emphysema, upper lobe uh, dominant, and lower, total lower uh, exclusion, and complete fissure patients. And uh, what we do in Istanbul in the last uh, six months, we have started to, uh, to do this procedure. Uh, and uh, now I have uh, 90 patients, uh, 14 men and five women. And, uh, their quality of life and oxygen consumption results are very good. Uh, but one of them, uh, I, ha I had to send to the thoracic surgery after uh, two months, uh, bronchoscopic volume reduction, because of uh, his left lung huge blue layer and uh, secretion. Uh, well, um, become a cover with uh, secretion and it, it doesn't work, it didn't work. And we have created a board and weekly grand round for the severe emphysema patients and my hospital become a referral hospital for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction 
patients. This is my uh, team. And conclusion, uh, bronchoscopic treatment for emphysema. Concept for the bronchoscopic emphysema treatment are evolving. Uh, definitive results went suggest small group benefit but large subgroup effect. Bronchoscopic lung volume reduction are safe, especially with the reversible method. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Trohan. I'm sorry we cannot accept the question because we are very short of time, about one hour after the scheduled time. The last presentation in this session by Professor um, Valesios Polychronopoulos. He is director of the Department of Research Medicine, Sis Mangulian General Hospital, Athens, Greece. Um, he spoke about the technical solutions to common problems during bronchoscopy. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture, and especially Dr. Halfway and Professor Safe for their kind invitation, and all of you have been here this afternoon. I'm Blasis Polychronopoulos, coming from Greece, from Athens, working in Sismanoglion General Hospital. Here is the hospital where I work. And um, I'd like to dedicate uh, this uh, lecture to the young bronchoscopists and to the bronchoscopists who have just started to uh, learn the bronchoscopy procedure because I'm going to say very essential things to provide information uh, written in the literature, how to overcome the problems that may face during the bronchoscopy procedure. So before starting the bronchoscopy, we have to inform the patient because, uh, as you all know, the best information the patient has, the less the reaction. We are going to pass the scope through his nose so he has to know what we are going to do to him. We are going to irritate him a little bit. So he has to know the irritation because if he does not know, maybe he is going to react. The second is the sedation. We have to give sedation according to the general assessment of the patient. If the patient is too old, we may not give any sedation at all if uh, also the local anesthesia has to be adjusted according to the patient. When you re go to the nasal chambers, we would like to pass the scope through the nasal chambers. We have to ask the patient how the scope was inserted in prior examination. Sometimes we ask the patient, which nasal chamber you feel it free? He says the right. We try to pass the scope through the right and the scope does not go. So it's better to leave this question and ask him if he has any examination before, which was uh, the best uh, nasal chamber. And another question, is he having nasal bleeding frequently? If he has any one recent uh, time, it's very important to do that because the nasal bleeding may be mistaken for bronchial hemorrhage. After we do that, the only thing that we have in our mind is how to pass the scope through the patient's nose. The first movement is we just bend the lens lever from this position down or up, depending how we face the patient or we are behind of the patient. And the second point is, in order to pass the scope through his nose, we have to combine two movements. First of all, very fine up. How it works, this please? So what I'm saying is we have to, combine, to combine these two movements, very fine up and down movements of the lens lever in conjunction and rotate a little bit in conjunction with delicate attempts of pushing the scope with the other hand. So how can work that? Is. So 
you know what I mean? Very up, very, very uh, fine movements on the lens level here. And we rotate a little bit to find the passage from the flexible part to overcome the nasal chambers. So very, very fine movements. And with the other hand, we push the scope to find the passage to pass through the nasal chambers. The first problem we may have is the epiglottis. Epiglottis may have edema or great curvature. How do we overcome that? First of all, we grasp, we keep very steadily the mobile end of the scope. Second, we ask the patient to take a deep breath and then we bend the instrument and we pass over the epiglottis. When we reach the vocal cords, we have to pay attention that we don't touch before local anesthesia is inserted. The problems that we may have from vocal cords are these four problems. First of all, the diameter may be very, very small, the minimum, and this may be due to anatomic reasons or to mob mobility. What we do? We ask the patient to take a deep breath, and during the deep breath, the diameter becomes a little bit bigger. So we are ready, and just before the next inspiration, we pass the scope very quickly. The cough is another problem. We have to inject the local anesthesia. We don't use the sanction, because sanction makes cough worse. We communicate with the patient. We ask him to take, breath, to take quick breaths, and then we pass the scope very quickly, and we reach to the middle of the trachea which is very important to be emphasized here for all the bronchoscopists who are doing bronchoscopy in the peripheral ways. Many of the times we do bronchoscopy and we, take, we make brushing procedure or biopsy procedure to the peripheral ways. And the procedure of the bronchoscopy has, is more than 20 minutes. That means the local anesthesia has been already absorbed and the patient starts coughing. And the mistake we do is we we push lidocaine in the peripheral ways. We don't remember that 80% of the cough receptors are located in the trachea, in the main carina, and the main bronchi right and left. So what we have to do is to take the scope out a little bit to reach in the main carina to, in, uh, to inject some lidocaine and then go again and work in the peripheral airways. The vomit reflex happens when we pass the scope through the mouth. If we do that because we cannot pass the scope through the nose, it's better to avoid pressure on the tongue. And the most important problem is the laryngospasm. Laryngospasm care should be taken to be recognized early. Laryngospasm is heard as an inspiratory strider, but always it is not present because if the larynx closes totally, you are not going to hear any strider. If the wind is um, um, outside of your door and your door is a little bit closed, you are going to hear the wind blowing outside. But if, you're closed, uh, if you close the door, you are not going to hear the wind blowing outside. The same as the larynx. If the, t the larynx is totally closed, you are not going to hear the inspiratory stridor. But what you are going to see, you are going to see the patient suffocating. Try to stand up, try to take the scope outside. And so you don't look at the saturation because saturation drops at the very end stages of this procedure. Look at the patient. If your patient is suffocating, stop, ask him to relax a little bit. You don't have to stop the bronchoscopy procedure. And also, it is very important to be emphasized that uh, laryngospasm may occur even at the end of the procedure. What do you do? Do you stop the procedure? No. Just ask the patient to relax. If the patient is relaxing and he's having low breathing, then he creates less negative thoracic pressure, intrathoracic pressure, then the laryngospasm is reduced. So ask the patient not to breathe very quickly. 
to try to make the patient relax. Interrupt a little bit the procedure. Give the patient some atropine, diazepam, and oxygen. And if the patient cannot afford it, just stop the procedure and prepare the patient for another bronchoscopy another day. The big problem the uh, young bronchoscopies have <clears throat> is when they enter the scope through the nose and through in the trachea and the large bronchi, this, the scope goes and faces the wall. So we have to try to keep the scope as centrally positioned as possible. In order to do that, we have to make, to rotate and uh, to uh, make five, mo uh, five movements of the lens lever. Small rotation and five movements of the lens lever and, in s and the scope is going to be centrally positioned into the lumen. There is also an international consensus because most of the bronchoscopies, especially the young bronchoscopies, use the sanction from the beginning of the procedure and when the procedure stops, they stop the sanction. We don't use the sanction continuously, only when necessary, because the disadvantages all are all these disadvantages. Here you can see from the book of Dr. Prakash what happened in a patient after continuous um, sanctioning. You create a mucosa which is nearly a hemorrhagic mucosa. Trachea. You have to observe trachea very carefully. There is no other way to see trachea better than the bronchoscopy. The biopsy sometimes requires require special technique. You have also to remain that the cough receptors are here, so just be sure to use the local anesthesia in trachea. Here you have tracheopathy osteochondroplastica. That means most of uh, this area of the trachea has been substituted by bone formation. In order to take biopsy, you need to take this uh, uh, forceps with the needle in the center in order to be sure that your uh, forceps is not moving. Sometimes you may have obscured optical field. This is the big problem with the flexible bronchoscopy. If you just move to a central airway and you use the sanction and you ask the patient to cough a little bit or to inject some normal saline, everything will go away. But sometimes this does not work. In order to make it work, you have to use this technique. You do very rough up and down motions of the lens lever. You can see here very, very rough movements of up and down. Uh, not in, as, as I showed in the first video, in conjunction with in and out movements of the other or, or no, of the other flexible part of the scope. By this way, you move the scope to the more central airways, and you rub the end of the scope onto the walls of the central airways, and all uh, the secretions go away. Sometimes. You, have, uh, you may have some orifices, difficult access, and you cannot observe it. Sometimes you can find an obstruction of uh, an orifice, but this obstruction is not due to a mass. It is from external pressure, it, but it may be mistaken as a mass. You can see here, the, uh, the one orifice is open, the other is closed, but if you check the CT, you are going to see there is a massive pleural effusion which caused this. The mucosa is normal, so don't describe this as a mass. You just push uh, the, the, the forceps and you are going to realize that uh, the orifice is open. Here, another example. Uh, if you don't go closer, you may th think that this is a necrotic area. No, it's not a necrotic, they are just secretions. If you ask the patient to cough, a little bit, or if you inject some uh, normal saline, you are going to see the bubbles coming out and both orifices are okay. Sometimes also you may have a difficult orifice. The apico-posterior and the apico-posterior of the right and left upper lobe. You cannot go very, very easy there. How do you do that? First of all, you take turn the patient's hand on the opposite direction. So if you would like to go to the left upper, you turn the patient's hand on the right. For bronchoscopies, we have to move around the patient many times to get better position. We don't stay the same position if this does not work for us. 
And uh, ask, we ask the patient to take also deep breath in order to overcome this uh, problem. Sometimes we may have problems during the biopsy. If the mass is necrotic, it's uh, before starting bleeding, we have to administer some adrenaline to avoid further bleeding. We have to be sure that your first biopsy is the best because sometimes it may be the last one because if an hemorrhage is going to happen, then we are not going to have good specimen. Sometimes the forceps does not open because it is very narrow, the orifice. What we do, we pull it a little bit back, but very little, because if we pull it more and we open, it's going to make damage to the bronchoscope. So we pull it a little bit, and then we push it forward, and then it's going to open. Sometimes, may I have two minutes, please? Sometimes the opening is not the opening we wish. It opens in the longitudinal axis. What I mean, you don't like your forceps to open like that because the biopsy is not going to be good. But you would like to open like that. In order to do that, you take the outer portion of uh, the forceps and, you, and, you, and then you turn it a little bit. Sometimes you have an edematous carina. It's very difficult to take good biopsies for your carina if it is a, a secondary carina, if it is edematous. What do you do? You don't straddle the carina. It's difficult to take biopsy if you straddle the carina. Just touch it a little bit, very gently. Try to avoid straddling. When you take the first biopsy by this way, this creates an anomalous surface, and then the second biopsy becomes easier. So if you try maybe the first biopsy, the sister is going to tell you that the first biopsy is not good. So don't give up. Try to take the same, in the same area, the next biopsy. It's going to be better. Sometimes the direction of the forceps is not to going to the area you wish to go. If an orifice is narrow, Therefore, you realize that the forceps goes to the wider one, not the, to the narrow. What you do, you catheterize the narrow uh, orifice with the scope, and then you push the forceps to this uh, orifice. And this is my last slide, showing from the book of Dr. Prakash as well. You have the brush here, which goes to a, a peripheral lesion, and you can brush the lesion, and uh, you can have uh, the brush cytology. If you would like to pass the forceps, not the brush, you can realize that the, these two, the flexible bronchoscopy and the forceps, are, the system is very rigid and cannot go there. So what do you do? So you put the brush and then you leave the scope in this position. You don't release the scope. Then you remove the brush and you try to pass the forceps for biopsy. When you reach at this point, you realize that if you push more the forceps, you are going to damage the scope. So you release a little bit, and then the forceps passes. But the message is you don't, you don't have to make the forceps pass more than a few millimeters. If the forceps passes more than a few milliliters, then the system again becomes too rigid and cannot bend. So just make sure that this part of the forceps, which is out of the scope, is just few millimeters in order to bend better. So you are going to take better specimen. So in general, we must have a clear idea of what we are looking for and why we are doing the bronchoscopy to the patient. Is it any reason for the patient to have the bronchoscopy? We have to be aware for the limitation of the examination. If we are not sure what we are going to do our best to do the bronchoscopy, we might have to ask another more experienced bronchoscope, uh, bronchoscopist to do the procedure. Because bronchoscopy demands great experience in order to evaluate the images correctly and to obtain proper samples from designated area. And as Hippocrates said, 
600 years before Christ. If you cannot help the patient, at least don't harm him. If you are not sure that the procedure is going to give any benefit to the patient, if you don't say that if you were the patient, you would like the doctor to do the same procedure to you, don't do it to this patient. So we have to think more and to do less. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Professor Boli Kronrobas, for his excellent, uh, well-illustrated talk. And at the end of this session, many thanks for our eminent speaker, many thanks for our audience, and many thanks for the organizing committee for the well-organized conference with an excellent scientific content. Thank you very much.